Welcome to FACT's webinar called Create a Quality of Life on Your Profitable Farm. Our presenter today is Ben Grimes from Dawnbreaker Farms. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating today's session. So before we dive straight into the presentation itself, I do have a, have a, a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, we are a national nonprofit organization that is headquartered in Illinois. We promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a variety of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. You're invited to visit our website to learn more about our farmer services, including our upcoming webinars, conference scholarships, and our Humane Farming Mentorship Program. So this time I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter, Ben Grimes. Ben runs Dawnbreaker Farms in North Carolina, where he raises pigs, chickens, ducks, and Thanksgiving turkeys for sale direct, um, direct sale to consumers and to restaurants. We're very lucky to have him with us to share his experience and strategies for increasing farm profitability while reducing workload. In fact, he gave this very same presentation or a similar presentation to this one um, at the Carolina Meat Conference earlier this fall. So without further ado, uh, I will turn the floor over to Ben so that he may begin his presentation. Ben, please take it away. Cool, thank you, Larissa, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and I really appreciate you guys all taking time out of your busy days to uh, listen to me and my story. Um, I actually see on here a few people that I actually recognize, and that's very exciting. Um, and I hope that my story today um, resonates with you guys and you can learn some valuable lessons from the struggles that I went through. Um, today, like Larissa said, I run Dawnbreaker Farms in North Carolina. I raise pigs, chickens, turkeys, and ducks for wholesale and retail sale. And I, this year I will gross about $200,000 and I will work about 30 hours a week. So I have a really high quality of life. I'm a very profitable farm, uh, but it wasn't always this way. And so my story today is gonna show you how I, where I started at, which I think is where a lot of you guys are in now, and then how I've developed over the years to become the farm that I am today. Um, so first of all, um, trying to make the slide switch. One moment here. So Ben, I think you might be experiencing a lag um, in the slides. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's on so the My go. Story. Yes, it's on the My Story slide right now. Gotcha. So you guys are seeing something and I guess I'm not seeing it. There we go. There's a picture of me with a pig. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So um, I grew up not in farming. I actually grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I grew up a very urban life. Uh, my parents were entrepreneurs. They were home, um, not homesteaders. They were entrepreneurs and business people. That's my background. I grew up not too far from the Space Needle there. Um, so I really did have a very urban life. Uh, there's nothing in my life that ga geared me towards farming, that geared me towards life with animals. Uh, we had cats and a dog, and I, I had some fish growing up, and that's about it. Um, and like most Americans, I grew up eating out of boxes and cans and jars and never thinking about where my food came from. But growing up in Seattle, everybody has this environmental ethos. And I was very, this environmental ethos really resonated with me. Um, I was really good about reducing my consumption, recycling everything. And when I was in college, um, my junior year of college, I came across the book Omnivore's Dilemma. And the book really resonated with me. And I realized for the first time that even though I was an environmentalist, the very food that I was eating was incredibly destructive to the environment. And this was really a, a, a pivotal moment for me because I said there has to be a better way to feed people that is not environmentally destructive. Um, and my first farming experience was in Minnesota in 2009, and it was on a vegetable farm. And at the time I was living in Minnesota. And I really fell in love with the lifestyle. I fell in love with the 
ability to, you know, have a seed and plant it. It grows into a plant. You eat the fruits of it. It really was this incredible magical experience for me. Um, and again, you know, it was because it w- this was when I was an intern. It was for a season. I was getting paid a few hundred dollars a month. And I didn't really think about, you know, how do you make this as a lifestyle? How do you make this as a business? It, to me, it was just this, this fun, romantic vision. Um, and after that season, you know, I really wanted to keep doing it. Um, I actually moved overseas. I moved um, to West Africa and Cameroon. And I lived there for four years. And in Cameroon, you know, I, I lived again as a city life, as in the capital city. Um, I did keep a little garden, and I got to work on some cool projects, um, agricultural projects out in the country with pineapple, papaya, mango growers. Uh, so there's a picture of me on the left with that. Um, but, you know, like many people who are in a position where they want to farm desperately, and they they just they're not in a position where they can actually do it. They live vicariously through other people. And so while I was in Cameroon, I spent a lot of time reading books. Um, So here are a picture of some of the books that I read. Um, And again, I think that during this time, I was attracted to the lifestyle of these books. Um, These were not practical books on how to make a living on how to farm, but they were this beautiful romantic vision of how these people had cultivated their lives in this very romantic way. And so by the time that I did finally get to start my farm in 2013 in North Carolina, I this was the vision that I carried with me. And I was going to create this magical experience on my farm, raising all these incredible heritage, anim- heritage animals and... Um, breeding all the animals myself and growing all my own food and having this abundance of meat and vegetables and fruit. And I had carried with me this romantic vision. Um, and so the the early years of the farm really did incorporate that, that vision. Um, this is a real picture of my farm. It's not edited or anything. Um, I don't mow the lawn as nicely as it was back then, but that sunrise is real. And um, those early years, what I spent a lot of time doing was everything. Um, My first year there uh, on Dawnbreaker Farms, I tried to grow all of my own food, all my vegetables, and I had uh, incredible heritage animals that I was raising and breeding, and I was doing about 10 different enterprises. I had an acre of vegetables, I was doing microgreens and sprouts, I was doing bedding plants, chicken eggs, duck eggs, uh, seven different kinds of meat animals. Um, it, was just, it, was, it was way too much. Um, some of the, let's go to the next slide here. I'll wait for the pictures to load. Um, So, you know, here on the right are, that's my early, you know, about half the early vegetable plot covered up uh, with row cover. And uh, on the left is a picture, and I'll explain this picture. My, um, I raise these guinea hogs, and guinea hogs are really an incredible animal. Uh, I think they, they hold a special place in my heart. Um, for those who don't know, they're a heritage animal. They've been around in the American South for a very, very long time. Um, they are an animal which I was very attracted to, and I was attracted to this vision of saving the heritage species, saving this heritage animals for future generations. Um, And uh, they were an animal which, um, the problem is that they're very small, and they're artisan. And so they take about twice as long to grow out, and they uh, have about half as much meat. So compared to, a, con, con, compared to a conventional hog, you have about 4x deficit there. Your conventional hog is going to grow to 250 pounds in six months. Your guinea hog is going to grow to, if you're lucky, 150, 150 pounds at 18 months. Um, so it's really a big difference there. Um, another kind of funny story is I had these Narragansett tur- turkeys, another really incredible heritage breed. 
um, that I was really, really into. Um, problem is I could not control these turkeys. Uh, these turkeys were absolutely wild. Um, in the mornings, they'd, they'd go and they'd get their feed and then they'd run around the farm all day long. Uh, at night, they would roost on my house, and so I'd be sleeping in my house and I'd hear these pitter-patters of turkey claws on my roof. Um, it really was a mess. Um, these early years, you know, I was running around putting out fires every moment because I didn't, remember, I didn't have any livestock experience, and I just jumped into it. And so I was running around, animals were getting out, I was having to chase animals, I did not have any infrastructure, so I was carrying buckets of water across the farm to get to the animals. Um, it really, really was a total and utter mess. Um, by the end of that first year and going into my second year, um, I was tired and I was broke, and I was totally, totally burnt out. Uh, my marriage was on the rocks, and I had no other option but to get another job. Um, and so then for two and a half years, I worked in another job, and I would basically farm at night. Um, in the morning, I would wake up super early in the morning, and I would do my farm chores. And then I would go to work and come home, and I would uh, have to put on a headlamp and start farming in the dark. Um, we just got to notice that uh, I guess it's a little bit quiet. Um, if I speak louder like this, Olivia, is this better if I speak louder? Um, I'll wait to hear from her. Maybe. Okay, well, I'll keep, I'll keep speaking louder. Um, I'll also put it on speakerphone maybe. That helps too. Okay, other people are saying they can hear me fine. Um, okay, so I'll keep it on speakerphone for now. Um, yeah, so I was at a point in my life where I was, you know, basically farming just at night. And I would have to get home from work after a long day's work, a very physical job. I'd put on my headlamp and I'd go out and farm at night. Um, there is actually a period of time, especially like this time of year in the fall, I literally did not see the farm at all during the day. I'd wake up before it was light. I'd farm. I'd go to, go to work, come back after it was dark. I did not see the animals awake during the day. It really was a terrible time in my life. Um, and this kind of place where I was, I was so overworked and burned out is where this romantic vision of the farm had taken me. Um, and I realized I either had to stop farming or start farming better. Um, and because I'm a pretty stubborn person, I guess I decided to start farming better. Um, and so since that period of time, I've really honed in and I've scaled up and I've automated my systems and built the farm business that I have today. Um, and here are a few of the lessons that I have learned over the years. I'll wait for that slide to load. Oh, more pictures of early days of the farm. All right. So here are a few lessons. Your time is valuable. I think that is the most important lesson that you can learn. Your time is really valuable, and you need to account for it. And when I mean account for it, I mean track your time. How much time does it take you to do a task? How much time does it take you to do an enterprise? Can you give yourself a justifiable hourly wage? And I'm not talking $8 an hour because it's going to be impossible to raise a family and to live a good life on $8 an hour. Can you give yourself a good wage doing the tasks that you need to do every day? And if not, I would analyze that and find out a way to either do it and do it better and faster, or get rid of it. Um, and what I did when I started doing this is I really started getting rid of a lot of enterprises on my farm. Um, I think that we carry with us in this farming community, we have a negative culture of poverty. You know, we feel like we are doing a righteous thing by farming, that we are feeding the community, we're healing the earth, 
and therefore we don't need money because all of our all of our validation is coming from these other sources. And while that is true to an extent, we still need money because we live in a 21st century capitalistic economy, whether we like it or not, and we have bills to pay. And the bank is not going to take your meat as payment of a mortgage. Uh, they're just not going to do that. So you need to figure out a way to actually make money. Um, and I think a lot of us you know, are happy to work for free, but what happens if you break your leg? Who's going to go out there and feed the pigs if you have a broken leg? Are you going to get your neighbor to go do it for free? You're not, unless you have a really, really nice neighbor. So I think you need to account for your time in a way where you include in your costs. Sometimes we can live on air. Uh, good luck with that, Christy. <laughs> I wish we could. Um, account for your costs in the way that when you're looking at your prices, you include either a salary or, a, or an hourly wage in your costs. Um, and so an, another step is to organize your priorities. What, it is, what is it that you want out of your life? Do you want to work all day with your animals? Is that something that inspires you? Is that something that you just makes you happy? Then I think that that would be fine. Is your priority to spend, like my priorities are to spend time with my family, um, spend time reading, exploring, traveling. I just got back from New York this week. Those are the things that are important to me. And making money, that's also another priority. Um, someone asked, what hourly rate do I use? In my spread, I give myself a salary, uh, but in my spreadsheets when I'm tracking time, I put $20 an hour. Um, I figure that Anybody who I hire will be very happy to work for $20 an hour if I hurt my leg. And then I can live off of profits. Um, so, you know, organize your priorities. What is it that you want out of life? And then organize your financial needs. So this isn't the farm's financial needs. This is your personal needs. How much money do you personally need in your life? Um, or how much money do you want to make? I think this is going to be different for everybody. Everybody's needs are different. Uh, but really sit down and analyze and be truthful about that. And then once you have your needs, how much money you need to make, then you're able to switch it and say, okay, how much money does the farm need to make for me to make that much money? Um, does that make sense to everybody? You can type yes or no or yes. Yeah. So it'll, it's Cool. Yeah, cool. That, yeah, I think this is a really critical point in my presentation is to know what you need to make. Oh, thank you, Angie. Or thank you, Shelly. Um, income minus cost. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Um, yep, absolutely, Deb. That's absolutely true. Um, all right. So Lindsay says she's not seeing people's answers. Um, so, um, just so, so folks know, only presenters are able to see what you're typing. So, Ben, if there's some oh. a point that you want, yeah, if there's a point you want to make, um, you <laughs> might just want to re repeat it. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, I, I didn't realize that. Sorry. So, you always have no idea what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> no, I, I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. Um, uh, basically, you guys all said yes. Um, so, I will. I will move on to. The next point, uh, which is create a mission statement. And um, if you guys don't already have a mission statement, um, it's something that you, know, you take a little bit of time and think about, something that I think is really pivotal to your farm business. Um, my, uh, Cindy says, voice is a bit muffled. Maybe it's a speakerphone. My phone is on speakerphone right now because uh, I was told that you hear me better on speakerphone. Um, Larry, Arissa, do you have any feedback? Um, I was able to hear you the you know when you were on speakerphone. Um, so <laughs> that would be my choice would be to just do your hand your headset or your handset. Um, but right. switching back to the headset, and I'll speak very clearly and very. Uh, I will. I'll try not to be muffled. 
And if um, folks can um, increase their volume on their phone at all or on their computer, that may also be helpful. All right, cool. Um, so mission statement. Um, so on your mission statement, this is the, qu the question that you need to ask yourself is, what is it that you want your farm to do and to be? I think this is something you can make clear and concise, and it's something that's going to guide you as you grow. And even though my farm has evolved over the years, you know, from those early days of being, you know, with this romantic vision to what it is now, my mission statement has never changed. Um, and so my mission, for example, is to A, be regenerative. So I want to actually grow soil. I want to make the land healthier than it was when I started the farm. Um, I want to be profitable. I want to make money doing it. And this is right there in my mission statement, these two things. I want to be regenerative and I want to be profitable. Um, and so there are things that I can do that would make me more profitable. I could raise everything in a barn and everything would be automated and I could climate control and I'd be extremely profitable, but I wouldn't be regenerative. There are things I can do to be very regenerative but that aren't profitable. Uh, there's different ways to raise animals or different breeds of animals to raise, um, but it isn't something that um, also makes me money. So I need both of these things to be true for my mission statement to be, to be there. Um, they have feedback with one another. Uh, the third part of my mission statement is to teach others to do the same. And so that's why I'm here today talking to you all is because I want to share this, this mission uh, of my farm. I want everyone to know that they're, through their animals, they can regenerate the land. We can sequester carbon, and we can make the world a healthier, more environmentally rich place. And I also want to teach farmers that they, we can do this and have a very high quality of life. We can make a lot of money. And so these, all three of these factors are important to me. Um, so this is something that I encourage all of you to do if you don't already, is to you know, really think about what it is that you want your farm to complete, what it is that you want your farm to do. And then I think once you have that, you'll be better able to organize your, your priorities. You can organize what you want um, out of your life. Again, for me, my priorities are to spend time with my family and to make money. And so I'm going to work my farm in a certain direction. Uh, if you're the kind of person where your priority is to preserve heritage breeds, then I think that, is, that can be worked into your mission statement. And I'm not saying that you have to be a lean, profitable farm like I am, but I think you have to follow your mission statement. And if you want to make money, then there are opportunities for you to make money. And if you don't want to make money and you just want to follow a romantic vision, I think that's fine too. I think that's great. The world needs that too. Um, but you have to have, be conscious about it and make that conscious decision. Uh, next thing that I think is really important, a hard lesson learned for me, is record keeping. Um, so record keeping is not my nature. It really, really is not. Uh, when I started the farm, I wasn't going to keep any records. I wasn't going to uh, track inputs. I was just going to have this beautiful farm where I raised animals in this incredible way, and money was just going to happen. Um, and unfortunately, that just is not the reality. And when I made that decision to uh, farm and be profitable, profitable about it, I learned out of necessity to keep records. Um, and records are really, really important because they help you make, records help you make informed decisions. Um, they're going to show you, okay, how much time am I spending on a certain task? How much does it cost me to feed a certain animal or to uh, process animals? Or how much money do I have in, um, what you know, ABC cost 
in my uh, ducks, for example. Um, and then once you have that statistic, you can look at it, you can analyze it, and you can make an informed decision about how you want to um, move. If you need to put more effort into something, if you need to find a way to whittle away some of the waste, or if something's really, really profitable and you need to do more of it. Um, so what I encourage you to do is to keep your vital, important vital statistics. Um, everybody's business is going to be a little bit different. Um, some of the statistics that I keep um, are like feed. Um, so time in, here's a, the time inputs by task. So I keep my time inputs um, by task, by enterprise, and batch. So that means like um, if I am doing, you know, building shelters on the farm, I have I keep time for that. Uh, for each enterprise, so I have four enterprises on farm. I have chickens, ducks, pigs, and turkeys. So I track each enterprise, but then inside of that, I track each batch. So for example, I had this year I had three batches of chickens. So first batch, second batch, third batch. Um, you know, and then for pigs, I have two batches of pigs, and so I track those costs. Or I track those time inputs, um, and this is really even though it's pr you think it's the same, there are slight variations which make a big difference. Um, this year, for example, my I usually run about 35 to 40 hours on a batch of chickens. This year, or my third batch of chickens was like 65, and I really I I didn't know why, um, and I couldn't figure it out. But analyzing that data showed me why. And it also showed me that this third batch was extremely profitable, even with that extra labor cost. So I, d I made a few tweaks in how I managed them, which took more time, but it ended up being more profitable. So now I can look at that data and say, okay, I've made these tweaks. I want to keep them, but I also want to cut down how much time I have involved. And so going forward, I can streamline and make it more efficient. And if I didn't have that data, I really, I just would not know. Um, I probably wouldn't even know that it took me more time, and I certainly wouldn't know that it was more profitable. Um, other vital statistics are, you know, your feed, production inputs. So for me, it's, you know, feed, bedding in the brooder, electricity or propane, um, you know, grit, uh, apple cider vinegar, which I use for my animals. So these are all my main production inputs. Um, and then I keep an inventory. So I keep an inventory of all the product that comes in, and then you know that way I can track each batch, each batch's profitability by how much meat I get, and then I keep a freezer, I keep an inventory for my entire freezer. Um, and I think that um, you know when you're starting out record keeping, you don't need to be fanatic about it. Um, I think that over the years I've I've honed in on what is important to me, what's not important. But when I started, I just kept started keeping records. Um, I really didn't have, you know, looking back, I was missing a lot of the things. But just start what you think is important, and then the next year you can know better what you need. But if you don't start now, then you'll never know what you need in the future. Um, enterprise selection. I think this is a really important one that we don't think about enough. Um, you know, I, I encourage people to choose one profitable focus and then laser focus inside of that focus. Um, so, for example, I do meat. Um, and then inside of that focus, my laser focus is I just do standard meat breeds. Um, I don't do heritage animals anymore. I just do straight-up pigs, normal pigs. Um, I do Cornish cross chickens, broad-breasted white turkeys, jumbo peak and ducks. Nothing crazy or fancy. Because to me, that's what sells. Um, I can grow, I can grow soil. I can be regenerative with any animal, but these animals are going to be the most profitable for me. So that's why I choose these standard breeds. That's my laser focus. I don't breed animals. Everything that I do is a feeder operation. Um, so that's my that's my focus. That's my laser focus. Um, for another uh, alternate example, could be someone doing meat but wanting to do heritage animals. Um, or heritage turkeys, or whatever it is. And then you can laser focus and say, I'm going to raise these heritage animals. Um, and then I think inside of that, you know, enterprise selection is what is your farm's maximum output? 
Um, so I think a lot of you probably have big acres. Some of you have small acreage. I have 20 acres, um, which is, for a livestock farm, very, very small. And so I had to decide, you know, what it is that I can do on my farm to make the living that I want. Um, and what I figured out is that doing um, – Using just my farm, the 20 acres that I have, I can gross about $300,000. Um, and so using the, using the enterprises that I have. On my farm, doing beef would not make, it, it would not make sense because I could only do a few cows a year. But I can do a lot of poultry, and I can do about 40 hogs, and I can raise them in a regenerative and profitable way. And so this is my farm's maximum output. And I encourage all of you to say, you know, what is your farm's maximum output? Um, if you only have five acres of land, then it might not make sense to do, you're probably not going to be able to gross $200,000 on five acres of land with livestock. But you can certainly do that with vegetables. You can make a lot of money on five acres with vegetables. And so just be conscious of what is your farm's capacity um, and what is it that, and then balance that with your own personal needs. Um, and then scaling up. So you really got to scale up for your maximum efficiencies. Um, it doesn't take me that much time or time to raise 500 chickens or 50 chickens. It's the same amount of time walking out there, checking on water, checking feeders. It's, it's re so you're really going to get a lot more efficient when you scale up. You're also going to get a price break when you order birds, for example, and also when you do um, uh, when you're buying feed and at the processor. Uh, whether you're processing yourself or you're processing off-farm, um, you're going to get a price break the more that you can scale up. Um, and so I think um, uh, one more slide about this, and I'm going to talk about you know, what I do on my farm now. And then we'll open up for questions and answers. Um, so really build the life that you want. Uh, again, this is kind of a summary of everything we just talked about. Um, how much money do you want to make? Remember, this is your personal thing. How much money do you want to make on your farm? And don't undercut yourself. Uh, don't say, oh, I'll do fine on $20,000. And that might be fine as a single person living in a trailer. But if you want to have kids, if you want to travel, you're going to need more money. Um, so, you know, think about that. Um, how much money can your farm produce? And do they line up? Again, this goes back to that question. Does it make sense to, can you gross $200,000 on five acres of, of livestock? Probably not. But, you know, switch your enterprise to do something that actually makes sense um, to meet your first goal, how much money you want to make. Um, and again, what are your priorities? You know, what do you want out of your farm? What do you want out of your life? Make your farm to be the vehicle which creates the life that you want. I think so often we let the farm guide us where we want where the farm wants us to be. And that is a path which leads us leads us to overworking and being broke. I think if you take charge and you guide the farm where you want to be then the farm is a powerful vehicle to create your life's dreams. Um, and then another thing is take a break. Uh, I think that we all need breaks. Um, and one great thing about livestock is we can raise a lot of them and then we can put them in the freezer and sell them. So we don't need to harvest every single week. Um, and I'll talk more about this when I talk about my farm. Um, so I think, you know, the data is going to tell you what your costs are in a really unemotional way. Your spreadsheets aren't going to lie. Um, and then once you know your costs, your personal financial goals, um, how much you need to, and how much you can realistically produce, um, you're going to be able to make the prices to attain your goals. So without that data, without knowing how much money you want to make, how much your farm can produce, then you're not going to be able to make the money to reach your goals. So you really have to have all of these things in line. Um, 
All right. So now we're going to talk about my farm and how I do things. Uh, we will open up in, I'll go quickly, and in five, ten minutes or so, we'll open up for questions and answers. Um, so my farm. So at Dawnbreaker Farms today, we have, I have four enterprises again. I do 2,000 chickens, about a little over 2,000 ducks, about 175 turkeys, and 40 hogs. Um, I sell all of this to a single farmer's market and then wholesale accounts across the triangle. I do restaurants, a few small mom and pop grocery stores, a few people's little, you know, custom made CSAs. Um, I'll gross about $200,000 this year. Uh, I have an average 50% profit margin, and I work less than 30 hours a week. Um, I really have a high quality of life, guys. I'm not going to lie. And it's achievable to all of us. It's, it's not just, you know, something that I've done. Um, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that all of you could do it. Um, so I've really, so, you know, one, the main thing I've been able to do is streamline, really, really streamlined. Um, got rid of anything that doesn't make money. Um, it really goes against that romantic vision that I had when I started of growing all these incredible heritage species and breeding everything myself. I got rid of all that. Um, and that was hard for me. But at the same time, it didn't compromise my mission. Um, I still am regenerative. I'm still profitable. I still can teach others to do it. In fact, my profitability has gone up. And I'm able to teach you guys even more because I'm doing something that is quite pro profitable. Um, question here uh, came in from Shelly. says, did you learn to do your own books or outsource it? I did my own books for a while. Um, I did them very poorly, so then I switched and I hired a bookkeeper to do it, and they do it really, really well, and they do it today, which is great. Um, another question is, do I have any help on my farm? I do not. Day-to-day um, uh, -day operations on the farm are just me. Um, unless I'm gone or if I am, uh, you know, yeah, unless I'm gone, basically. Um, the farmer's market is the exception. I do have one person at the farmer's market who I do market with. Um, some other questions come in. I will uh, come back to them in the questions and answers. Um, all right, so, yeah, it really went against my romantic vision of, you know, doing all these, all these incredible heritage animals and breeding everything and growing all my own food. But it was more important to me to be profitable than to carry this romantic vision because I wasn't going to be able to farm with the romantic vision. Uh, someone asked about why I stopped doing heritage breeds, and it was, yes, they don't bring in the money. Uh, and another thing is that it's not the market. People are not ready for that market. People are used to double-breasted chickens. They're used to you know, broad-breasted turkeys. They're used to standard pigs. If you bring them a, a guinea hog pig, it's all fat. They're not going to know what to do with it. Um, uh, so the other main point is that I am a feeder operation only, so no breeding animals at all. So I buy young animals, and then I grow them out and process them. Um, this has really cut down on the amount of time that I have to do things. Uh, and a great example of this is with pigs. Uh, before, I had a boar, I had sows, and then I had growing pigs. And then they all had to be moved around to different places at different times. So this really was, you know, at least three chores a day. Now I do one group of pigs, one, group, one set of chores a day. It makes things a lot easier. Um, I do everything in big batches, and I put it in the freezer. So those 2,000s of chickens... Uh, those 2,000 chickens that I did, um, those were three batches this year. Next year, I'm going to pare it down to two batches. So that means it's only twice a year next year that I have to do chickens. That's four months out of my life. Um, pretty easy. And then it goes in the freezer, and I sell it year-round. Um, a lot of questions are coming in, so I'll go quickly and then let you guys spend more time on questions and answers. Um, another big thing is I grow during the optimal time of the year. So... I'm really only growing from 
uh, about March through June, and it really isn't busy until May and June. And then I take July it's entirely off. I have no livestock on farm in the month of July. Uh, let me say that again. I do all of my production April or March through June, nothing in July. In August, I get my turkeys, I get pigs, and then it's all wrapped up by Christmas. Um, so that gives me the entire month of January, the entire month of February, and the entire month of July with no livestock. That is three entire months of no livestock. So it means all of my production is crushed into that short period of time. And my only really busy time is May and June and late September, October, and November. So it's really, you know, uh, I'm growing in those optimal periods of time. That's where the animals want to be outside. That's when I want to be outside. July, North Carolina is no fun. January and February, North Carolina is no fun. I don't want to be there. The animals don't want to be there. Um, Uh, let's see if there's anything else that I really need to touch on before I open up the questions and answers. Um, so I have really intentionally streamlined things and I've organized my life priorities and what I want out of life. And like I said, um, one of my top priorities is spending time with my family. I have a seven-year-old daughter and she's the light of my life. Um, nothing makes me happier than being able to go and pick her up from school and go get ice cream with her and just go hang out. And that's my daughter here on the left. And this is a day about three years ago. Um, this is her best friend here on our right, her left, in the pink is her best friend. My daughter is the one in the white coat. And we went to, my friend and I, and my best friends happen to be my daughter, the parents of my daughter's best friend. And we went out one day to go get some pigs. And we drove together, and we get back to my farm, and as I'm, as I'm unloading the pigs and getting them settled, my friend and I turn around and look over, and these girls are just sitting on top of the car, having the time of their lives, talking who knows what, but just over the pasture, my neighbor's cows are in the back, the pigs are there. And to me, I realized this is why I'm farming. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing, is because I want moments like this. I want moments like this where I can spend time with my daughter and with my friends doing the things that I love. And it's because I've, I've taken hold of the business and I've designed the farm to be the way that I want it to be, to get the life that I want out of it. This is why I'm able to do these things. And there's certain sacrifices that I've made. I've had to give up my romantic vision. I've had to give up heritage animals. But in the end, I've crafted a life that I love. I've crafted a life that gives me time to spend with my family and friends. And I've crafted a life which gives me a very good income. And so I'd be very, I want all of you to be able to get this. I, I, I know the struggle that many of you are in where the farm overtakes your life. But I want you to take control of the farm and let the farm create the life that you want so that you can have the happy moments like I do here. Um, so thank you all for, you know, listening to that. Um, I'm going to go over some of the questions now. Um, <laughs> so Ben, there was a question that came in that um, you might not see because it went into a different section. So I'll just read it out loud. Um, the question is, what is your most profitable enterprise and why? Uh, good question. Um, it really depends. So my pros most profitable is ducks when I sell them retail at a farmer's market. I have about 80% profit margin. Um, but when I sell them retail, it's like 30%. Uh, so it depends. But for the most part, like turkeys. Turkeys are just a major profit house. Um, and another great thing about turkeys 
is that it's four months of work, so longer than a chicken, about the same as a pig if you're buying feeder pigs. But you get all your money at once. So last, was it? Yeah, last week was Thanksgiving. So last Monday, I harvested all my turkeys. On Tuesday, I sold all my turkeys. And by Tuesday night, I was a very happy, rich farmer. Um, and so it's, it's quite profitable. And you also get all of your money at once. So turkeys really are incredible. Um, if, if a lot of you, you know, have other jobs, um, can only farm part-time, I think turkeys are great because you're going to only have a few months of work and you're going to get all your money at once. It doesn't take a lot of time to market the turkeys um, or to sell the turkeys. It's not like chickens where you put them in your freezer and then you have to sell them bit by bit. Um, so turkeys are really, really great. Um, after that, you know, chickens and pigs are, are quite profitable too. Um, there's nothing that I do retail at a farmer's market which is less than 50% profit margin. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so I guess we'll just start going through some of these questions. Um, folks, think of other things to type in. Feel free if we don't get them all during the session. Um, We'll be able to do some follow up after the fact, but so I'm going to just read some out loud, Ben, for you, and and then yep. you can respond. Okay, so we have a question: How much time do you or did you spend developing your markets? Um, yeah, you know, figuring um, that. Out. So markets are really really important. You can produce all the food in the world, but if you can't sell it, there's there's really you're not going to make any money. Um, I know a lot of people who jump into it, myself included. I uh, jumped into doing all this stuff, and I had no market for it. Um, the markets have developed over the years. Um, I got really lucky in my second year of farming. I got into a really great farmer's market, um, and that has been really what I've built the foundation of my business on. Um, and there's a slide going back a ways that shows my setup at the farmer's market. It's really professional. It's clean. It's well-organized. Uh, don't be that farmer at the farmer's market where you have one big cooler with 50 different items in it. Someone asks for a pork chop, and it takes you five minutes to dig out that pork chop because you're looking, you've got a pig foot, and you've got a whole chicken and drumsticks, and you're just looking for a pork chop. Your customer's going to walk away. They're bored. And if they happen to have the patience to wait, they're not going to do it again. So make it streamlined. Make it efficient. Make it create a good quality customer experience. Um, for wholesale stuff, sometimes people reach out to me. Uh, more often than not, I'm walking into kitchens. Um, so I will, you know, I have found that chefs don't respond to me when I email or text or whatever. So I just walk into the kitchen um, during a slow period of time, like I'm going to do this tomorrow, between 11 and 4 when it's not busy yet. I'll just walk in with a duck in hand and say, hey, are you guys interested in this? Um, and sometimes, you know, they're like, no, and then you leave. But more often than not, they're really happy that you came to their kitchen. Even if they don't want your product, um, they're really happy that you're there. Um, so, you know, you got you to gotta hustle. You got to hit the pavement, be creative. If you're in an area where, um, you know, there's not a great farmer's market, you got to be creative. Think about the restaurant scene. Um, that's another thing when you're, when you're creating your farm is what is the reality around you? Um, you know, do people are people even willing to pay for expensive chicken? And if not, I don't know, grow lettuce and tomatoes. And everyone's willing to pay for that. Um, I think that you got to know where you're at, or can you access a good market? Great, excellent. Okay. Um, and someone actually asked, is that a farmers market you're at? Is that a year-round market? Yep, I do a year-round farmers market. Okay. Um. So when you say 30 hours a week, someone asks, is that across all seven days or are you able to take some days off like the weekend away? Uh, I mean, I can, I can align things so that if I, I, can, I can run away from the farm for a day. Um, it does take a little bit of strategic planning. Um, I have to, you know, like I'll feed the animals at night. Like, if I'm, like I've gone away for the weekend before and what I'll do is like I'll feed the animals at night. They're all set up on automatic waterers, so water's not a problem the animals at night and that'll buy me you know a day or two um also having lots of feeders and bulk feeders 
that allows you to put more feet out there. Um, so, yeah, I can get away if I need to. Generally, even on the weekend, I'm going to just walk out and check on things. Even if I know that things are set up, they're fine. You know, things can go crazy. During the height of the season, I'm going to have, you know, 3,000 animals out here on farm, and you just got to, you know, make sure that nothing crazy happens. Um, but, yeah, that, that's going to be spread across the seven days of the week. But that also is really intensified during basically May and June, late September, October, November. Um, and then, you know, then it's it can be anywhere from, you know, like 12 to however many hours I want to do. Like in the wintertime, uh, I'm really – I don't want to work. Uh, so it's going to be a different workflow. Um, I'll spend more time doing business stuff, analyzing costs, um, marketing, but only if I want to. Sometimes I just want to sit around by the fire and read a book all day or go to the trampoline house with my daughter and jump around for a little bit. Um, it's really however I feel it. And I think working that into your system allows you to have that freedom. And I think the main thing is you can design the farm to be whatever it is you want it to be. If you want to only farm every other day, set up your farm to do that. If you can only farm on the weekends, set your farm up to do that. Just create really bulk feeders. If you're the kind of person that wants to go out and play with the animals every single day, set up your farm to do that. It really just depends on you and what you want to do. But, yes, I when I have animals on farm, it's seven days a week, and that's spread out over the 30, 30 hours. Um, some weeks it might be 60. Some weeks it might be five. It really varies. Um, and a lot of that, keep in mind, a lot of my, most of my production, actually, most of the time that I spend on my business is not an actual production. It's going to be more like 12 hours a week is just the farmer's market. Um, deliveries, you know, that's a half a day right there is deliveries. So you're looking at 14, 16 hours every single week and just doing sales. Um, and so the actual production of my farm is just, it's a small part of what I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so, it's really you know, interesting, yeah. I spend more time on the business than in the business. So and actually a question that's uh, connected to that is someone's asking if you do your own marketing and advertising. I do at this point. I haven't had any need to do it. That's my favorite part. Mm -hmm. I love farming. Don't get me wrong. I love going out there and seeing how the land responds to animals and growing animals. But to me, I love business and I love doing business. So yes, I do my own marketing, advertising. Um, that's my favorite part. I love sales. I love having this product that I believe in and being able to take it to customers and see what they do, see what they, how they respond. Um, so yeah, right now I do. Excellent. Okay. So we probably have time for maybe two two more questions, um, just so folks know where we're at. Um, so we have a question about restaurants. And if you're seeking to sell the restaurants that can pay your price, um, do you, how, how does that all kind of work for you? Because I, I imagine there's there might be some negotiation with, you know, what restaurants are willing to pay versus what you, you know, your product is worth. Yeah. Absolutely. Good question. Um, with restaurants, what I do is, um, I mean, I know what my cost is. Uh, I know how much I have in a duck and I'm not willing to, and I also know how much money I want to make and how much money my farm can produce. And so I'm, when I go to my price, when I say this is my price, I'm not going to really budge. Um, if they don't want it, then I'll go somewhere else. Um, it's basically what it comes down to. Same at the farmer's market. Um, you know, a lot of people don't want to pay $6 a pound for a chicken. I don't really care. This is this is my reality. Um, I think that when you know your costs, you're able to stand firm and say, no, this is what I need. This is, you know, what I need to make it work. And if the chef's not willing to work with it, go somewhere else. Try something else. Don't lower your price to get into a restaurant. I've seen too many people lower their prices and especially with chicken, and then what happens is they go out of business because they lower their price to make it more attractive to people, and then they can't be sustainable financially, and they fail. So know your price, <laughs> hold firm to it, and if they don't want it, walk away. Excellent. That's great, great advice. Um, 
So the last maybe topic we can talk about just a little bit, because I'm man, we may have maybe about 10 people wrote in questioning questions about your processing, butchering, how you do it. Do you do it on farm? Do you have a relationship? How do you develop that relationship with your processor? So maybe you could talk a little bit, um, a minute or two about uh, how that works for you. That would be great. Oh, yeah, there's a lot. I see all the questions now. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so uh, for pigs, I take them to a third-party processor. Um, I just dropped off a batch of hogs yesterday, and I got my other one to take in in two weeks. Um, I used to work with a processor close to me. I felt they did a really bad job. They really didn't care that they were doing a bad job. And so I went to a further processor. Uh, now to go f- to a processor who's about three hours away, um, but they do a fantastic job. They communicate. They do just a really good job in how it looks um, because your processor is going to ultimately determine how your product presents to people. And most customers don't realize that there's a, there's a processor. And so if your product looks bad, it's your fault. Your processor doesn't feel that because you've already paid them. But when it's hard to sell a pork chop because it's got cut badly, it's got broken seal, whatever the case, um, that's on you. And so I travel further to go to a better processor. Um, I had a smaller trailer. I sold my small trailer. I bought a big trailer. So now I can haul 10, 12 pigs at a time. And, you know, so amortize the cost of that trip. Um, I only have to do it four times a year. I do two batches. I bring them in 10 at a time, so 10 each trip. Um, so it's not that bad. I get to go hang out, go on a hike down in the, you know, it's down by the coast. So I go spend the day down there. Um, so, you know, have that conversation with your processor. If they're not willing to work with you, they're not willing to do a good job, find someone else. Uh, for poultry processing, I do it on farm. Um, I actually have a, a commercial facility. It's actually set up as a second business. Um, so when I count the $200,000, that is not including uh, my processing business, dependable poultry processors. It's a separate business, separate accounting, separate everything. Um, but I do send my poultry through that facility. So it's on farm, quote unquote, but it's it's a separate facility, separate business. Dawnbreaker Farms pays dependable poultry processors. Um, so, uh, and how do I... I think a question about that is like, how do you scale up um, when you harvest on farm? You just you just got to do it. Um, there's a really great course um, that I put together with uh, the producers of Grass Fed Life. This is a podcast. Uh, if you if you Google right now, it's called um, a Pasture Poultry Processing Course. Um, and anybody who's interested, I have a, a code that I can give you for a discount. You can email me or text me or whatever. Um, I'll give it to you. Um, but that course right there is really the most valuable asset that you can get. Um, I'm also, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, plugging it because it's mine, but also I think it's the most valuable resource out there for processing. Um, and that'll walk you through, you know, all the steps on how to scale up because I think think that the biggest handicap for people when you're processing on farm is how do you scale up? Um, and you got to have the right equipment. You have to have enough labor, um, and you know you're you're not going to do it overnight. You just got to practice and do it over time. Um, a few years ago, I could only do about 75 chickens in a day, and that was a full day work uh, for a crew for a crew. Um, now we can do you know 10x that. Um, so you just you learn over time how to get more and more efficient. Wow. And the question is, you must be getting good prices on both yeah. for processing. Uh, no. I mean, I pay a premium for pork processing. I pay a premium to get my poultry processed. Um, you know, I just work that into the cost, and then I put that on my customers. Wow. Uh, I know that we didn't get get to quite every question, although I think we got through quite a few. Um, so when I'm... Uh, sending out the email, the, the follow-up email, I will include Ben. Um, I'll CC you just so if folks want to kind of follow up about anything, um, they are able to connect with you if that sounds good. Um, 
So I do have just a few housekeeping items before we sign off. Uh, reminder that immediately after this webinar, there is a very brief survey and we'd really appreciate it if you take a minute to fill it out and tell us about your experience. You know, we're always trying to do these webinars better. Um, also, if you have ideas for future webinars, um, that's always helpful. It's something that I can put on our list. Um, recording the slides are very soon, as soon as they're processed, <laughs> talking about processing, um, I'll be sending out an email with those documents, hopefully later today. Um, a quick plug for some of FACT's other farmer services. We do have many more webinars coming up this winter, including one next week. Um, that's actually not on this list. Somehow it got left off. It's about our Humane Farming Mentorship Program. We're accepting applications for the mentorship program through the end of December. So I'll include links to all of the webinars and more information about the mentorship program in my follow-up email. Um, ben, do you have any parting thoughts before I close the webinar? Not to put you back on the spot, but. Uh, definitely put me on the spot, but uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that if you have any questions about, you know, how to, you know, track data or analyze your costs, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can find me online, websites, DawnbreakerFarms.com, Facebook, same name, Instagram, whatever platform you want. I'll be happy to uh, talk with you. Excellent. And I think the most important thing is just to do it. Uh, <laughs> just do it. Um, yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you so much for all your time to get today. Yeah, thank you, Ben. It was, it's been a pleasure to have you with us and, you know, your experience and insight and taking the time to answer questions and follow up is really appreciated. Um, and thank you to everyone out there that's still hanging in with us out in the audience. Um, thanks for your attention and your interest as well. I hope that we see everyone on another webinar again soon. So have a lovely afternoon and um, we'll connect again soon. Bye, everyone.